Welcome to today's webinar brought to you by DataVail. I'm Stephen Fegg, Director of Database Trends and Applications and Unisphere Research. I will be your host for today's broadcast. Our presentation today is titled Vector Databases, Innovating Data Management in the AI Era. Before we begin, I want to explain how you can be a part of this broadcast. There will be a question and answer session. If you have a question during the presentations, just type them into the question box provided and click on the submit button. We're going to try to get to as many questions as possible later. Plus, all viewers today will be entered for a chance to win a $100 Amazon gift card just for participating. Now, to introduce our speakers for today, we're excited to have with us Michael Argawal, Director and Global Practice Leader, Cloud Databases at DataVail. Krishna, Director and Global Practice Leader of MySQL and MariaDB at DataVail. And Jorge Onikama, Practice Leader of Analytics at DataVail. Now I'm going to pass the event over to Michael to get us started. Welcome to the broadcast, Michael. Thank you, Stephen. Glad to be here. Uh, before uh, I jump into the uh, presentation, um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the company three of us uh, work for. Uh, we are all about data and databases. And uh, also, whether it's a uh, on-prem or cloud, we help customers uh, build new data lakes, analytics, and now we're actually helping customers with AI and generative AI. We are 15 years in business. Uh, we have or we are Oracle Platinum Partner, AWS Advanced Consulting Partner, uh, Azure Solution Partner, as well as Advanced Specialization uh, we have. And also we have invested um, building our own intellectual property uh, called Tech Boost and Service Boost, which help us with uh, many support. Uh, we are uh, 1,200 plus employees in uh, US, Canada, India, and Colombia. I'm not going to go over each and every uh, thing we do at DataVail, uh, but we do you know, support databases, uh, migrate databases, uh, both app modernization, database modernization, um, Oracle ERP, uh, like uh, EPM and uh, many other ERP products. And also, of course, the analytics, which is one of the main topics for uh, presentation today. So today agenda is full. Hopefully you get some learning, some fun, or maybe if you, it's a lunch hour for you, maybe lunch also. But hope, uh, hoping we going to have a lot of discussion today. We're going to start with uh, what are vectors all the way to uh, how we, how we're going to use vector databases in the context of AI. So let's start with some basics. What is a vector? And if you remember your high school math, uh, vector has a uh, length and a direction, right? So it's very similar con uh, concept here also. Uh, you get a vector for every, uh, whether it's an image, text, or video, uh, for every uh, embedding that you get. So in, in essence, a vector is a mathematical representation of data, and then data could be a... A simple abstract in a, of a book, it could be image, uh, it could be the book itself, and, and there are a lot of more possibilities. Here I'm showing you a simple example uh, where you are making a uh, open AI call, uh, you provide, providing the authorization key, and the text I'm sending to open AI for getting a vector is uh, your first String goes here, right? That's the text, the line number six on the on the uh, on the uh, left side of the code. When I send that uh, text to the OpenAI, uh, I get an embedding back. So on the right hand side, you see the response what I'm getting back. Uh, it it kind of tell you that it is an embedding, and the line seven to line fourteen has the embedding back, and that's the the vector representation. Now, uh, the model I'm using, which you see in the uh, left left hand side, uh, the text uh, embedding small, uh, it comes back with 15, 1,536 dimension. So I'm not showing you all the all the dimension, but you see the, in the on the right hand side what a, a typical vector embedding look like. So that's that's what a vector is in the context of uh, vector database and AI and generative AI. 
Now you might ask why you want to create a vector or embedding. Uh, embedding is a when you have a lot of vectors, you can start to see how they relate to each other. That's that's what we try to measure. Our our goal is to see how a a text one text may be similar to another text, right? So, so in in some ways, we're trying to figure out how they relate to each other. So that's the reason we're creating vectors. Um, and you don't have to use OpenAI. There are many other uh, large language models out there. Anthropic uh, came with uh, Cloud3, and then uh, also, you know, Gemini and many other large, uh, Google Gemini and many other large language models out there. So you can use any of those. And the, and the idea to get these vectors back so we can relate them and come to some conclusions. And I'm going to uh, cover some use cases in the later slides. So if you get a vector, um, do you need a vector database? And the answer is yes. So this is, this is a very important diagram to understand. So on the left, you have a content. The content could be uh, a, a, a text, it could be image, it could be video. Uh, so the idea is to grab all the contents. So if you are uh, working in retail, it could be a product description for all the products you sell. That's the content it could be. Uh, if you have uh, trying to index all the books, you know, uh, the uh, all the abstract of the books, that could be content. Uh, or if you are in a streaming business, uh, the description of the uh, TV series or movie could be content, right? So you're passing that content to an embedding model, uh, which could be uh, OpenAI or any other large language model. And then you get the embedding back, which we saw in a previous example, you're getting an embedding. Now, when you have millions of embeddings, uh, it's hard to manage all that. You know, you need a place to store, search, and whatnot, right? So that's where the vectors database come in. So ideally, you will take that vector embedding response from OpenAI and store it in a vector database. Now, you might have an application which uh, which is looking for something similar, right? So in in case of if you are a retail organization, you have all the product description. Uh, the application may be describing, a, a user might log in and say, okay, I'm looking for a product and a user might describe a product. Uh, and then that description uh, is sent to OpenAI again and you get embedding again. And then the vector search happen and you get the, the query results back. So that's kind of the flow, um, a generic flow for a um, generative AI vector data, database. And you can see the importance of vector database where you can store, search, index, and do uh, and do uh, the is mostly the search that you can do uh, for your vectors. So we covered what is vector search. Uh, vector search is a way is is important that you're trying to figure out what vectors are close to the query vector or or each other. Now these examples or use cases. Um, uh, are very important, right? Whether there's a search, clustering, recommendation. So if you are uh, in a home, if, if, a, if a customer is a um, home improvement store, like, uh, like a Home Depot, Lowe's, right? Um, you, they may already have a keyword search, like you're looking for a product and it finds for you. Uh, but sometimes you don't know the name of the product and I'm one of those where I go to a store and go with a part in my hand because I don't know how to do, how to I don't I do not know the name uh, but I might say that if I'm searching online I might say or, or on an app I might say oh, okay so plumbing component uh, it connect the pipes and it look like a L shape you know and it might tell me what part it is um, so that's that's one example right where I I created created all the vectors stored in a vector database now a person might Instead of doing a key search, keyword search, I'm describing the part or I'm actually describing the problem and able to search it. And you can think about that in, into many other industries. You know, in a, in a healthcare, you may have patient a doctor's note. It may be uh, genomics. It could be uh, if you are in a uh, uh, law, uh, um, 
law uh, and judicial systems industry there might be a lot of judicial records that you may want to archive and search right so the search is the most common and a lot of other use cases kind of in some ways a a a, a, a version of the search uh, clustering is where um, that let's say you take all the books in the world uh, all the abstracts get uh, get uh, indexed uh, and you will start to see clusters, right? Clusters could be a, a fictional versus non-fictional books. You, you will see large two clusters and within uh, non-fictional, you might see history uh, history books and science books and things like that, right? So clusters start to form and then that might help you understand your products, your business model um, and help you make uh, uh, data, data-driven decisions. Recommendations, uh, I think we're all familiar at this point. Uh, people who use reading books or shopping on uh, Amazon or eBay or or uh, uh, or maybe Netflix you know, streaming, you know, we, we are, we're all users of recommendations. And recommendation is has two areas, right? It, it does have a representation of the vector uh, in general. So in case of Netflix, all the movie, TV series, all the Data set description have an index, for example, but it also knows uh, your uh, preferences, your demographics, and try to help you understand what what that next recommendation could be. Anomaly de- detection uh, could be used uh, in many many industries. Uh, so if you are in a healthcare, um, a normal CT scan look like what it look like, and you know, uh, and maybe a male versus female may have a different. Uh, uh, groupings, for example, uh, but a, a abnormal CT scan may stand out when you start uh, uh, creating the uh, vector and start presenting that uh, with other vectors, and that's how you can find anomalies. The other example is, uh, let's say you are a game warden uh, and and you install camera which take pictures, and you know, and it categorizes the different uh, animals that you find. Um, you know, it could be bear, it could be uh, deer, it could be anything, right? And it it takes a picture and categorizes that. And and, uh, and but if something is not found, whether it's, whether it's a picture not taken good, or something new found, or maybe maybe, maybe a, a bigfoot, right? Uh, but the idea is to find something out of the ordinary, and it could be many many uh, use cases in almost all all industries. The diversity measurement. Uh, you know, originally, of course, the idea is uh, our country is kind of has a lot of uh, different uh, racial backgrounds, nationality backgrounds, uh, social, economical, different backgrounds. And we want to, as companies hire, you know, they want to make sure they are able to have a representation from different, different uh, diverse backgrounds. But that's not the only uh, use case for diversity, though. Uh, so if you are in a, for example, glo- clothing brand, um, you might have, uh, you may want to say that, okay, I have different colors, but I want to have, have a different uh, re- representation around the three three primary colors, which is uh, red, blue, and yellow. So you want to make sure there's a diversity in the, in the color of the selection, for example. So th- there are many ways you can use diversity uh, measurement. Of course, the nonprofit government uh, you know, sectors are very much into measuring the diversity. Uh, classification is a another subset uh, in some ways for for clustering. Uh, classification in some ways kind of force you to classify. So, for example, clusters kind of they form on their own. Uh, so, a, for example, a, a book may have history and science both, right? Um, and if I'm working in a library, I cannot put a book somewhere. You know, there's a history shelf and there's a science shelf. I have to pick one, right? Uh, so that's where classification will help, where it is going to force that book to be either a history or, and you define the cate- uh, criteria, what, what that classification criteria is. So, but, but here, everything is classified into one category. So why a vector search is important? Uh, vector search is important because it's looking for a similarity search with a meaning. So it's not a keyword search, um, which we used to in, in our databases, we always doing, 
you know the like uh, syntax like some statement right um or the traditional search on a database would, could be first name last name date of birth right where you're finding a a person in a in a database you know so this is very different this is more of a of a uh you have a representation of text image or video and in most most common cases are the text and images and then you're trying to find a so if you say if you if you are storing all the vectors for a text you want to uh, have a, a, a new text and you want to find what other text may be similar to it right so it's more semantic uh, it's more about the meaning and what that sentence might represent uh, compared to a keyword Key may, keyword may not be found but the meaning may be same um, if a database cannot store vectors and cannot search uh, let me put it other way if, if 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 a database does not does not have a vector search capability then it's not a good database to store vectors and that's the reason you will see that many database engines now whether it's a mongo mysql mariadb oracle 23c coming up Azure SQL database already has it, um, Elasticsearch, uh, and then many new, new databases, they all come in with vector search because they all want you to use their database for storing vectors. Uh, but if there's no vector search, you cannot, there's no benefit of storing there. Right? So that, that's the reason why you want to pick a database which, uh, which can do vector search. It needs to be fast, uh, a, depending on the use case, uh, it could be millions or billions of records and you want to pick a, a vector database which can help you uh, with a faster vector search um, behind the scene uh, there are two or three algorithms that you want to want to be familiar with what vector search is doing behind the scene uh, for a small vector size uh, you know, you might be okay with k nearest uh, uh, neighbor algorithms uh, but uh, anything you know medium or large size uh, there's a either a approximate nearest neighbor algorithm or something something uh, similar to that or or a derivation of that 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 behind the scenes these uh, vector search engines are using uh, to find the relevant vectors for you uh, with that uh, i will turn over to jorge to uh, cover uh, a little bit more deeper into the ai uh, how vector databases vectors fit into the ai model and actually, he's also going to cover a use case study that he worked on. Yeah, so um, good afternoon, everyone. So I'd, I'd like to uh, just go over a topic that you may be wondering now, why do we introduce large language model or AI? It, it is because um, I think it's a combination of the need of using information and how we can detect patterns out of that information. Until uh, a few years ago, um, it was just possible through numbers. And the community developed all sorts of algorithms that were focused totally on numbers. Uh, not until recently, due to the um, very well-known uh, paper about transformers that enabled the community to develop um, a special type of algorithms, uh, uh, machine learning algorithms, uh, through neural networks that that possibly uh, that made the possibility to transform the text into numbers, and that's why we now today have vectors that let's consider them like a fingerprint of a, a paragraph of a text. And, and now you hear vector data, databases because that is becoming a special feature in um, those databases. And like uh, uh, everything else, databases can be specialized, but uh, as it is uh, now a very demanded feature, almost every relational database is adding that feature. And you'll see that in the future months, uh, probably available in your most, um, preferred uh, database. Um, so with that context, then allow me to explain the reason why we are using this uh, slide here. The 
Artificial intelligence is an umbrella for all that we do and in trying to automate and do things um, from a, a repetitive uh, behavior. Um, we call artificial intelligence to that technology that enables any a digital device or um, computer that try to mimic the uh, human behavior. And that is only possible through a specific algorithm. The, this algorithm is the result of uh, some type of modeling uh, by, by using uh, neural networks, because um, this is, there are different ways, but neural networks prove to be the best approach to uh, identifying um, uh, patterns within data. And um, that is uh, a special type of neural network that is related to large language models, and that is the deep neural network, All right? And keep in mind that whenever you hear the word large language model, it, it refers simply to uh, a huge neural network that uh, the data has to go through to identify and detect patterns. Okay, so what's the applicability of this? When, let's say, you have information in, in the internet, the whole internet, the published information, and you figure out a mechanism like a web crawling, grab all that information, and then get that information into text, and you use a huge neural network, and then in machine learning, those who are familiar with it, it's all about determining the parameters, the weights that those neurons need in order to predict accurately um, any unknown um, uh, previous input. So with the knowledge of the internet and a huge neural network, we can create a data model. There are many data models out there today, which are called uh, base, base models, and some examples of them are listed here that are now available. Some of them are open source, meaning uh, you can download and, and play with them. Some others are private, and the only thing that they allow you is to um, send your request and you will get an answer and they will charge you for that. Those are the, the private um, uh, large language models. But then <clears throat> if you have a, a company that has a domain specific knowledge, not published in the internet, how would you do? So probably you would think that you can also use the same approach. You take your PDFs probably, you use the information from internet, and then you think that you can use um, a large language model, uh, I'm sorry, a neural network, a huge neural network with a given architecture, and then train it, right? Find out those weights. But, well, today, February uh, 13th, is unfortunately too expensive. It costs millions of dollars. But things are changing rapidly, so do not be surprised if probably in the near future this changes, that you would be able to soon customize your neural network and run and find out those weights yourself and keep everything private for you. But until that happens, there is a workaround to grab that domain knowledge and into um, a specific um, um, domain uh, of your company. And that is by the use of a vector database. And how does it, how is it done? Typically, you would take the PDFs, you will, will uh, use some mechanism to extract the text from those PDFs, and then create blocks of text, and then store those blocks of text into a database but you will not store it as is. You will store it with a specific addition, that fingerprint that I was talking about. And in that way, you will create um, a specific domain knowledge specific to your industry or to your company or to your, to your spe specified application. And some examples are there. You can use um, a domain knowledge in medicine, in law, in finance, etc. 
Now, once you have it defined, what you could also do is fine tune it. And it's not that expensive. It, it will cost some money, but it's not as expensive as training the whole neural network. Um, you will, in addition to the to the to the uh, vector database, you will fine tune. What is it? It is what you probably heard around um, prompting, and probably about um, completion. So those are specific works of the anti artificial intelligence world that will generate your model for your specific domain uh, knowledge. Let me jump now into the next slide, which is the following. How it is used, right? How it is used, a vector database in artificial intelligence. This is called uh, generative uh, uh, augmented um, applications. So retrieval augmented applications, or RAG, uh, as they are also known, are applications that um, for one side you have an application like a chat where the user interacts with it and on the other hand you have a domain knowledge uh, and how does it happen so imagine that you have uh, videos pictures or, or text and you identify a mechanism to extract the information from them and convert it into text once you have that then you will get the text um, and identify some um, a fingerprint. And we already said that you, you can use one of the pre-existing data models, uh, text embedding models, to do that for you. Once you have uh, that uh, fingerprint, which is the vector or the embedding, that process is called embedding, then you're going to get the vectors and then you're going to um, store it, right? So the process is like that. You store it in a database. So you have your domain knowledge, you parse it, uh, so to speak, into a large language model that will create embedding, meaning degenerating your vectors, and those vectors are stored in a database. Okay, now you have a domain knowledge. What happens next? You make available this knowledge through an application. The user interacts with the application, asks questions about the domain knowledge or about the specific knowledge. The question goes through the large language model again, uh, converting that text into a vector. And then this vector, now the text is converted into vector, and then the vector is going to look for a similar vector in that vector database. And the vector database will respond with the, the closest vectors to that one using a specific algorithm of proximity. And what happens then? Now you have a, a short list of vectors that are associated, because remember, those are the fingerprints, are associated with text. And then you pass that to the large language model. And then the large language model converts the vectors into text. And then you have a sort of natural conversation at that point, right? Um, moving on, we had a customer uh, of the financial industry. And they wanted us to run a proof of value using this uh, approach of uh, using a domain knowledge with a vector database. Uh, they presented to us ar ar around 86 uh, PDF documents. Uh, and then the idea was that by um, enabling them and the usage of this application, it will accelerate uh, the assimilation of information uh, or the content of that uh, information in those PDFs so that they can um, perform their job better. They, they, they wanted to identify uh, some answers of that specific those documents, and those documents contain tables, and they contain pictures. And so it, it, it was quite interesting. And we used the techniques of the RAC application, and, and we use a vector database. It was totally developed in, in an Azure platform. And and the reason why, well, more or less, this is the architecture. On the left-hand side, we had the documents. Um, it was just PDFs. Um, then we beforehand uh, converted those PDFs into vectors, and we stored it in Azure Search. And we um, connected them with the, um, the Azure AI, which is the, the, for the natural language conversation. Right. On, on the other hand, on the right-hand side, we had the web application. So all this was deployed in Azure. 
And the reason why we chose Azure is because it was very friendly. Now it's even more than before because when we did it, it was just coming up and there were some um, uh, preview features that we leveraged as well. And like I said, everything is evolving as we're speaking today. And these were the reasons back then of why we used it because it already provided uh, an easy configuration of creating an index. If you're familiar with uh, search engines, you, you uh, probably know what an index is. An uh, indexer, uh, the possibility to schedule uh, the updates of the index when the data change, meaning a new PDF comes in, it was very easy to do that in, in Azure. And then um, we enabled some features because it was embedded also as part of the skill sets. It's a feature of the Azure service and so on. So, um, yeah, I think that's the part that was uh, about the, the use case of AI. Happy to answer any questions that you may pose at the end of the presentation. And um, here I pass the baton to uh, Krishna. Thank you, Jorge. Welcome, everyone. With the rapid evolution of Gen AI and the demand for AI applications continue to surge, vector databases play a key role in AI space. And it's because their ability to efficiently store, retrieve, and contextualize data in real time makes them more appealing for these applications. Let's take a step back and see what are some of the basics here. These can be categorized into three main different types. Of course, vector libraries, they are lightweight, open source, easily available, and you can be integrate them easily into your application codes through API calls or uh, direct integrations. There are most popular open source libraries available, like Facebook's AI similarity search, which is mainly used for image recognition and product recommendations. And we have Spotify's Anoy, and uh, of course, uh, Google's scalable approximate nearest neighbors. And then we have specialized vector only databases. Again, these databases are mainly for a specific use case uh, that's storing your web vector embeddings inside the database and then querying for semantic search. And then we have large enterprise databases that are also supporting. Depending on which data type, database type you choose, they all perform the same basic steps. One is vectorizing the database, storing them into the vector embeddings are being stored into the database and then performing a semantic search of those vector embeddings. Whether you're performing an on-prem application or you have a cloud embedding model that you need to integrate into your systems, these can be choose and integrated irrespective of whether cloud or if you have a self-managed system or or a, a cloud managed integrated system. If you have a large enterprise database, whether you're using a relational model or a non-relational model, they're all coming up with some sort of vector compatibility, either through generation of vector embeddings inside the database, storing them, or just uh, providing an ad hoc vector search functionality. Moving on. Let's understand some of the basic functionalities. Vector databases have many use cases because of their uh, adoption into AI applications, ranging from natural language processing, image recognition, and into recommendation systems. And Gen AI applications are more exciting because they all provide a unique way to interact with, which is in natural languages. However, these large language models often face challenges for not being accurate. How many times have we seen, of course, you know, you may get uh, recommendation systems, but sometimes you may feel they might not be not accurate or not relevant for your specific scenarios, right? And that's because these large language models are mostly trained on public data. And most of the times when you try to integrate them into your applications or into your enterprise organizations, they might not have the full information about the data that you have. It could be your product inventory, or it could be your uh, recommendation systems, 
or it could be the lack of uh, knowledge-based information. And that's where RAG helps to bridge that gap of training these large language models into your uh, enterprise external data sources. And if you have a custom model, obviously you may be having a different approach, but you know we all know how expensive it could be to start developing and building a new custom model. Contextual data is important because it helps predict user understanding, behavior patterns, and changes in their uh, interest. Without contextual data, the relevant information might not be up to date for your specific needs as the user behavior and patterns changes. And semantic search is an important fact because you're not just matching a keyword here. You're trying to understand the meaning of it and correlating that with your contextual data to provide a, a more relevant and accurate information. And how do you measure it, right? There are most popular ways of measuring it, but some of the most popular ones are, I would say, uh, measuring the vector search between the distance and the angle between the vectors, which we call uh, a combination of hybrid approach when you have a full text range scan and analytics on a comprehensive model solutions. Vector embeddings generation is a complex task because you may be having multiple data sources. It could be audio, text, images, or a series of uh, PDF documents. And because of all these multiple sources, generation and choosing the right algorithm for those vector embeddings is going to be a complex task. And vector search is an expensive operation computationally because you know you have to find those relevance between the, the embeddings. And when you have uh, you know thousands and thousands of uh, uh, streaming data that's coming in and uh, you know vectorizing them and contextually matching them for relevant information is going to be highly expensive. And indexing, again, uh, when you have a series of streaming of data that's coming in, updating your indexing strategies could be more and more complex. And uh, it, it would mainly, depending on which type of indexing methodologies that you use, it can be highly memory resource intensive. Bottom line, you know, generation of vector embeddings and providing that similarity search are some of the key main aspects and features of any vector database. Going along. Let's look at some of the vector capabilities that we have in MySQL and MariaDB. The traditional way of doing things is obviously you could store them in your blob, JSON, or text formats, and uh, you can draw relationship between that. When you have uh, you know two-dimensional, three-dimensional, things might work, but when you have n-dimensional mappings, things could get become ugly and more complex, and you might not be finding the relevant accurate information there. And that's why the introduction of uh, new vector data types is going to be more helpful and appealing to all the users. Most of the database uh, vector search functionality is based on HNSW. Uh, if you're not familiar with HNSW, it's, it's a hierarchical navigable small world uh, algorithm, which is think of it as a multi-layered graph structure where you have uh, relevant information of vectors are grouped into smaller nodes. And those can be interconnected at a hierarchical level that makes it more uh, faster in doing efficiency similarity search. Heatwave is one of uh, MySQL's in-memory storage engine that can help you with your analytics. It's a combination of uh, analytics and transactional engine that can help you combine your data types and workloads for not just uh, transaction analytics, but your, for your machine learning capabilities as well. Heatwave is available in OCI, AWS, and Azure. And uh, if you have uh, you know, a specific vector store type that you need to develop, then you could actually have the vector embeddings generated inside the, inside the database. Heatwave Lakehouse offers currently the vector capabilities, which is currently available in AWS. Uh, they use a specific uh, uh, text encoders to generate those vectorizations inside the database. Here is a quick snippet of uh, the similarity search with the vectors and without the vectors. 
MariaDB come up with a similar vector engine. Of course, uh, those you are currently using MariaDB already, you might be familiar with its uh, connect storage engine, which kind of enables you to store, uh, you know, the vector embeddings inside the database already. But uh, there's going to be a more advanced to vector specific storage engine, which is under currently development. And Amazon has joined hands with MariaDB to help uh, build this vector engine. And of course, followed by uh, Microsoft, IBM and Intel, etc. These are all based on, you know, uh, HNSW indexing methodologies. And again, as I mentioned, the most popular methods are searching the distance between the vectors and the angle between the vectors. I'm curious to see which one uh, gets into the community faster. But, uh, 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 and last week, if you are familiar, Google has come up with uh, their Cloud SQL offerings uh, with vector search capabilities. Of course, this is based on their scan library, which has a uh, vector distance functions, and uh, it has multiple index types, which also related to, you know, the, the brute force methods and tree-based indexing strategies. Google's Cloud SQL offering has uh, multiple uh, distance measures, not just with the cosine, but they also have L2 and dot product methods combined together. I'm sure there will be more and more uh, indexing strategies that, that will open up to inefficiently perform this uh, semantic search. Planet Scale uh, is uh, compatible for MySQL. They have uh, scalable distributed database solutions available. And they are also developing a vector store and index capabilities, which is currently under development. I have some of the links uh, shared in the later section. If you are interested, you can sign up for those uh, private preview and uh, uh, invite only kind of uh, uh, engagement so you can uh, explore it yourself. We'll have a more detailed uh, in-depth comparison of these things in the future section, but I thought this would give a high level introduction of the capabilities what we currently have with MySQL and MariaDB. All right, uh, with that, I'll hand it off to Michael again. Hello, uh, so Postgres SQL um, is a very popular relational database engine, and some of you may be new to it, so I kind of give it a little bit uh, recap about Postgres SQL. Um, it's a good alternative uh, to more license-based databases, Oracle, SQL Server. In fact, some of the customers that we work with uh, they moved away from Oracle SQL Server and went to either MySQL or Postgres SQL. So we did that conversion for them. The Postgres SQL adoption, uh, I, I, I say, increased a lot because of the cloud. On AWS, uh, there is a RDS and Aurora both. Uh, Aurora has a lot more performance capability. Um, so options there. And then also on Azure, a managed instance has a single flexible server options. Uh, GCP Cloud SQL also has a Postgres SQL, and recently the OCI also offer Postgres SQL. And because of all the cloud platform supporting Postgres SQL, the uh, adoption has increased. Very strong Postgres SQL community. Um, you need something. There's extension for it. You know, whether it's a benchmarking, performance tuning, there's this replication. There's extension for it. Uh, of course, uh, the PG community uh, came with PG vector uh, extension for vector search. Uh, and I'm kind of sharing here a simple example where you do have a embedding vector uh, 15, 1536 dimensions. Uh, you store this uh, ve vector and then, you know, you're searching it here. Um, uh, you see the uh, you see the real distance, but uh, cosine distance is more around the the direction uh, of the uh, and the, uh, not only the distance but the but the direction the vectors are pointing. Uh, the uh, Euclidean is more about the distance between the uh, vectors, and here you are searching the five uh, vectors close to the uh, the query vector that you get from the search. Uh, MongoDB, uh, some of you may be new to MongoDB. Uh, it's the most popular NoSQL database, uh, probably the uh, number one popular. Uh, it has a free uh, community edition. It also comes with Enterprise Edition and Atlas Edition. Uh, very strong, strong developer community. Um, 
you can find a lot of uh, packages and whatnot on GitHub for if you're a developer and working with MongoDB. Uh, it, it does have a horizontal scaling. That's one of the reasons why customers might pick NoSQL database over relational database because they want that horizontal, horizontal scaling. And the number one reason why it's very popular is, is the uh, MongoDB being a, a document repository, you know, JSON documents. Um, another reason why MongoDB adoption, adoption uh, increased last uh, 10 years is uh, due to cloud. Uh, you can run on virtual machines, on, you know, on Azure EC2, it's called EC2 on AWS, um, or Compute Engine GCI, you can run uh, on a virtual machine. Or you can also, if, you, if you're using Atlas, it can be configured uh, in uh, AWS Azure GCP, and then you can pick the region where your application is running so that your database is close to the application. Uh, the vector search uh, came out recently. Uh, initially, it was version 7 only. Now, version 6 also. The latest version 6 also support vector search. And I'm sharing here a simple example of the uh, syntax where you do have a vector index and the path to identify. And then queries where you, your application is sending a query where you want to find uh, similarity vectors. Uh, here, uh, you know, you, you might have number of candidates 100, but you might limit the top five. Uh, so that's kind of uh, a simple example for uh, using vector search in MongoDB. There are many new, very, uh, very, uh, uh, sorry, uh, there are many uh, new uh, vector databases which came out. Uh, the two most popular ones that I have come across are Pinecone and VV8. They both are, you can you can call born in the cloud or generative AI era vector databases. Uh, they can, you can run them on AWS Azure GCP, uh, all three or any other cloud on uh, VV8 you can run on uh, on-prem also. Uh, so the Pinecone does have a serverless option where it does, uh, uh, auto scaling uh, to uh, increase auto scale to up and auto scale down. Uh, you do have a hybrid search. So if you are mixing vector search with other types of search, you can do that with Pinecone. And nam namesets allow you to kind of have different schema models or even environments if you want to use name namespace for that. It does have integrations with many uh, popular AI services or uh, analytics solutions like data, data bricks in this case, uh, Snowflake. Uh, VV8 is, uh, is the difference between Pinecone and VV8 is VV8 is open source. Uh, and it also, also, you can also get a Docker image so you can, so you can run in your own Kubernetes environment if you want to. Uh, VV8 also have a cloud-based service, uh, but it's its own cloud. It's not necessarily running on AWS, Azure, or GCP. It's running on its own cloud. Um, it's, it does have a hybrid search, just like Pinecone. It does vector index compression, which could be very important if you are trying to bring all that into a memory. And uh, it has integration with uh, many other uh, uh, AI and analytics solutions. The the difference between Pinecone, VV8, uh, if you ask me, Pinecone is more uh, less installation configuration. Uh, pretty much configured and you start using it. Uh, VV8 is uh, a little bit more um, burden on installing configuration. Uh, if you use cloud-based cloud managed service, uh, the drawback there is it's hosted in its own cloud. So if your application and other data lake and whatnot is in AWS Azure or GCU or some other cloud, you can have latency or, or even uh, data egress charges, for example. Uh, when you do uh, Pinecone, it does give you option whether you want to pick AWS, Azure, or GCP. So that's kind of big differences between Pinecone and VV8. They both are very popular. Uh, from my experience, Pinecone being you know the solution for enterprises who want to use native cloud vector databases, but with less uh, uh, burden on install installation configuration. VV8 I have seen using in more uh, tech companies where they don't mind open source, they don't mind installation configuration, but they want to use the uh, vector database uh, free of cost. Uh, with that, I will uh, 
turn over to Krishna, who will cover common challenges for vector databases. Thank you, Michael. All right, uh, we are at the innovation and adoption curve of Gen AI. <clears throat> Excuse me. And because vector databases are new, uh, they, you know, they need to be really well integrated into your existing application architectures. And there are so many options available, so which one to choose? And I think that's one of the common questions, right? If you already have an existing database that you're using for your enterprise applications and stuff, you may well, very well be integrated into, you know, the adaptability skills. But one of the common challenges is, you know, how complex it could be to integrate them and to ensure the data flow is streamlined correctly and uh, to ensure all the security and governance best practices are in place. And not to mention uh, the data duplication and storage costs that needs to be integrated, uh, ca calculated into. And because these are new and they are uh, expanding, uh, you need to ensure you have the technical skills to handle and support them, uh, especially if you have multiple databases that need to be uh, managed. So the way I see it, right, I mean, of course, you have these specialized vector databases. They may do uh, a common task for, you know, vector embedding, storing, and retrieval. But, you know, if, if you have two complex systems, uh, it can be a challenge to manage multiple data systems there. And not to mention the ETL processes that's going to pipe in the data from one source to the other, another, and uh, the time uh, it's going to take to perform those activities. It would be an interesting to compare how they perform uh, with respect to you know latencies and query responses, especially when you have your large data sets that continue to grow, and not to mention the availability and scalability requirements uh, that that tends to happen uh, as your environment size grows and your application integration modules um, get more and more complex and integrated. So. Definitely, the, the push for specialized vector databases might have to be reevaluated as we, in terms to efficiency, performance, and cost, uh, and how, how many of them can be easily uh, integrated with your existing systems, and if you can replace them with some of your commercial vector capabilities that are uh, continue to evolve. So. That's probably one of the, the most fair, some of the factors that I would consider, you know, to be evaluated before we choosing the right database for your right specific needs. Again, there could be some specific use cases uh, that may be well suited for picking one of those solutions right for you, but um, enterprise level, you may be, you know, worth exploring um, what, what considerations needs to be done. With that, we want to give enough time for Q&A and uh, I'll hand it back to Stephen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Krishna and Michael and Jorge as well. We have lots of questions from our audience today. Great topic. Um, so to kick things off, um, first question, can you explain how vector databases leverage vectorization and other techniques to optimize data storage, retrieval, and processing for AI and machine learning uh, workloads? Michael, I'm going to direct this at you, and if you would like to, um, you know, let uh, Krishna and Jorge weigh in as well, you know, I'm going to leave that to you. Okay, Michael, are you uh, still on mute, maybe? I was on mute. Thanks. Sir. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Krishna, uh, you want to answer this? Krishna Hore, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I can uh, go ahead sure. If you want. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hore. I can chime in. Yeah. So, I think um, we, we need to rephrase the question because the question is about how can uh, a vector database leverage vectorization? It, so, if it is a a vector database, it obviously will uh, allow uh, provide some type of feature to uh, store a vector. And the question is about then how this feature optimizes the data storage, retrieval, and processing for AI and machine learning workloads. I think it, it, it will definitely enhance uh, the detection of um, of, of a pattern by means of the vector itself, right? The, the feature of a vector, it's a number. It, I mean, text converts it into numbers, which is a mathematical element like a vector. 
And now with a vector, we can do all sorts of, of, of operations. And one of them is proximity. Um, we, we can use a, a distance metric. Uh, and in and the community and and the software providers have used proven distance metrics um, uh, mathematically and in, in terms of technology and and that feature is now there. So in terms of then how that feature is uh, benefiting databases into data retrieval, it is doing the it is doing that in that way by accelerating, automating, using proximity uh, concepts and and doing this all through numbers. So I don't know if you want to add something more, Krishna. Sure. So uh, again, uh, going back to the question of, you know, how vector database leverage vectorization, right? So when you say vectorization, depending on, you know, what, what are we vectorizing and how are we creating those vector embeddings is going to be the, the crucial role, right? If you are using some external libraries uh, and uh, models to generate those vector embeddings, you know, there are lots of uh, generic models available, right? And uh, how optimal we are storing those vector embeddings inside the database. And as again, uh, as, as I explained in the earlier slides, right, uh, there are some options available to generate those vector embeddings inside the database as these uh, vector engines vector specific engines get more and more mature i'm sure there might be more and more uh, embedding models that will be added to efficiently generate those vector embeddings and they can be you know uh, stored in a semantic way along with contextualizing in real time that makes it more more uh, faster for retrieval and going back to the, the indexing types right those indexing models going to play a crucial role and that's where where we see more and more enterprise database solutions are coming up with multiple indexing options and strategies to uh, efficiently perform those semantic search relations i hope it, that that helps answer the question Absolutely. Thank you, Krishna and uh, Jorge as well. Next question, Michael. Uh, the question is, so relatedness of text strings uh, would not detect similarity between, uh, for example, zip code, postcode, and postal code? Hey, Michael, are you uh, still with us? I'm with you, and I'm. I was on mute still. So sorry about that. No um, so, so uh, it will detect uh, whether it's zip code, a postal code, because you're looking at the meaning and not necessarily the exit keyword. Uh, so if if your sentence or paragraph has whether it's a zip code, postal code, it will uh, figure that out that that is related. related. Uh, I was talking to my coworker this morning, and you know we were talking about taxi versus uh, three wheeler versus. I think it's called uh, tuk tuk in some countries, but but the idea is it, it will know you know what you're talking about. Uh, it also know the difference. For example, whether there's a windows glasses versus eyeglasses versus glasses for taking drinks, it kind of know the difference based on uh, based on the sentence. So so it's it's very good about the meaning of it, and not necessarily so much about the exact word that you're looking for. Understood. Thanks for clarifying. Next question. Uh, data privacy regulations are constantly evolving. How does Dataville ensure its data management solutions comply with these regulations, especially in the context of AI applications? The, um, so, the, so the data privacy and security was there before AI, and I think, I think a lot of those concepts still up, apply. Uh, so a lot of AI applications, especially with generative AI, uh, there's generally data lake, whether the data lake has uh, blobs of text or blobs of images, but there's a generally data lake, right? And the idea there uh, with with privacy and security is, um, you know, all these security principles, the least privileged model, uh, decentralize the data for lower environments, um, and, uh, Putting the right uh, auditing in place, uh, making sure we use the encryption, um, making sure it's not public and uh, internally controlled. You know, all those aspects of it still apply, whether it's AI or not. And with the with the AI, also now, when you do get a AI response, um, do you, do you have as an organization do you have additional responsibility? 
to use in a responsible way. And that's where additional checks can come in where, uh, yes, I, yes, I have a response or recommendation from the AI engine, but is it, is it ethical? Is it right thing to do? And, you know, so, so definitely you need additional checks in, in, in addition to the normal security, data security and privacy things that we always have done, uh, to use, uh, AI applications, uh, in a safe manner. Understood. Krishna, did you want to weigh in on this question? Sure. Again, uh, going back to the, the comment from Michael, right? Uh, the regulations and the security protocols uh, would still need to be applied, especially, you know, uh, when you have these uh, large models that are training on your training data and getting them integrated into your enterprise models, right? And uh, <clears throat> again, security is, is more concerning because, you know, you don't want your training data sets to be combined. With your production data sets and uh you know th those uh you know what what data to be uh you know, secured what data needs to be masked and do you may have pia data or phi data depending on your application requirements and types that problems you're trying to solve so those regulations and controls would still need to be built in in fact in a more uh, uh, uh tightly uh before we say you know uh, th these can be applied altogether Understood. Uh, moving on to our next question, I'm going to try and get us through a few more. I know uh, the bell has already rung, uh, so to speak. Uh, next question, how do vector databases offered by Dataveil optimize data management for AI applications that rely heavily on traditional data management? I, I can, so I can I start. Can, I can touch yeah, go ahead, that. Krishna. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Christian. So when we say data management, my understanding is uh, is, is we are referring to the 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 analytics piece of it if not uh you know obviously uh because these vector databases are new right uh, and they some of those they lack uh, uh the data management capability at this point uh, but as i mentioned going back to the large enterprises that have the vector capabilities uh, i think those are the best options if you're looking for uh, more data management capabilities analytics and integration pieces of it but yeah it would be an interesting analogy to see you know what the future uh, is going to be when uh, we have all these uh, enhancements available. Understood. Thanks, Krishna. Okay, next question. Jorge, this is for you. How do vector databases play a key role in unlocking the full potential of AI, specifically in areas like image recognition and language processing? Interesting question. Because the idea here, again, is convert anything that is not a number into a number. So image recognition, it's all about pattern detection. And there are algorithms that will convert that image into a number, right? Then language processing, again, it's text. There are algorithms nowadays uh, that will convert the text into numbers. Now, now, once we have it into numbers, then we can do all sorts of things and at that point we can use any algorithm to process the data if you want to do classification if you want to do uh, clustering if you want to do pattern detection like anomalies etc cetera, etc cetera. so vector databases play a key role because now along with that particular data type we can store it with its fingerprint right the vector uh, and in that way, we can operate and do all sorts of, of, of things with them. So that's that's why it's so relevant nowadays, especially in, in AI. Understood. Jorge, can you elaborate on how integration of vector database technology is shaping the future of AI-powered search functionalities? Thank you. Yeah, precisely. So because of this feature now being available in a database, you don't have to move your data out of uh, what it is. And the, the databases that have that feature will allow you to do all sorts of analysis, enabling applications that require that information, um, especially in artificial intelligence, um, to do all that um, integrated, right? And, and therefore, there you see that every day there are more databases offering this feature. Now, like like a, a, a different car model, you, you will. It, it's it's a matter of a taste. If you're already 
happy with your software provider and you, you're familiar with that database, it will become very soon that feature available there. If your, your soft database provider doesn't provide that feature, then there are specialized databases to provide you that feature. And it's okay because, well, if, if you've been like me around the, the evolution of relational databases, now you see what the, the databases can do. It, the, the relational databases do can do almost everything, right, inside the database. It's a matter of time and then a matter of taste and how happy you are with your um, software provider. Got it. Or hey, one more question for you. Um, if we share vector embeddings with LLM in uh, using the RAG technique, then proprietary data is public. You know, what alternative uh, is there as opposed to relying on a large language model? Um, well, the first the first thing I want to ensure here is that organizations of the like uh, <clears throat> that we know, right, that the, the big corporations, Oracle, Azure, AWS, they promise and they ensure that your data is kept safe and secure. That's the first layer. They ensure that. And the large language model that you're using is going to be used by you. And that's in, in their... Um, a confidential agreement uh, that the data or the information that you're provided for, of your domain knowledge doesn't go beyond that your 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 repository. So, but if in in the end you, you don't want to trust them, you can still use an open source large large language model. Being an open source and the performance of many of them are almost as equal as the ones that which are commercial or the private ones and and again it's a trade-off because at that point you need to decide if you want to use that which is open source and you want to train are you ready to spend that amount of money to uh fine-tune them or train them um and and like i said during the presentation um maybe uh, not that far um soon that you're going to get those costs really, really affordable to you. But until that comes, you, you have to decide um, on, on these agreements and, and use it on your on your um, own specific knowledge, uh, domain knowledge. Understood. Thanks. I Jorge. could probably tap onto that Good a question. little bit. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. So obviously tap onto that, right? So and that that's where, you know, if we, if we want to use uh, the generic uh, large language models that are widely available, or if you want to build a custom model uh, for specific to your requirements, where you know, you know, you have control on which models or modules you want to make it available and visible. So not all bits and pieces are processed in the same way, right? So uh, again, if you have the time and, uh, you know, uh, resources, you can always customize those models by the same time uh, oftentimes they also provide some sort of customization uh in in the large language models that you can easily integrate into your existing models thanks krishna okay uh two more questions and then we're gonna have to wrap up the large majority of our audience has stayed with us quite uh, long past uh, 3 p.m eastern appreciate that um i, I think it's just a testament to how how much interest there is in this topic. Um, so one additional question, many multi-model uh, databases, multimodal databases like MongoDB are coming up with vector search option in their platform offering. However, we also see many vector databases like Pinecone, Milvis offering only vector database. Why would someone go for only go only for a vector database instead of going ahead with uh, a multimodal database uh, such as MongoDB? It's Michael here. I, I can take that one. So yeah, Ma MongoDB, uh, PostgreSQL, uh, Krishna covered MySQL, MariaDB, Elasticsearch also have vector search. And I think the idea with multi-model is um, that you already know uh, the database engine. You're already working in other projects has some familiarity. Um, so in, in those cases, you know, you already have the process in place, how to install, how to configure, how to backup your infrastructure security team already know how to take care of all, all of those aspects of it. Uh, so in those cases, if you are already using Mongo, 
you can definitely use Mongo for storing your vectors and searching there. You know, same goes for uh, MySQL, MariaDB, PostgreSQL, Elasticsearch. You know, they all um, do vector search. Now, um, if you are building something from new and open to some new ways to do uh, vector, uh, storing vectors or searching vectors, and you don't necessarily, you know, you have a new team, you know, they don't necessarily have to have, you know, a existing platform that 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 they know or they're open to learning uh, uh, new databases. Yeah, the, the Pinecone, Vivid, both could be, you know, there are many out there. Uh, Milvus, another one. They could, they all could be a good option too. So it's not necessarily, you know, a very easy thing to decide, but from my perspective the, the easiest decision is what are you familiar with already uh, can you scale what do you have already to uh, something you can use vectors on and if that's the case there's no reason to necessarily go through the learning and figure out what pinecone is how to configure it and all the aspects of it understood krishna was there anything you'd like to add to that uh no i think michael covered it so thank you Okay, fantastic. I think at this point, we're going to need to wrap up. Um, Krishna, Michael, anything else you'd like to tell our audience? No, the one last yeah. thing, I, th I think I think the vector uh, generative AI got a lot popular. Uh, last year, when I started using ChatGPT, I'm like, oh, yeah, that works. The uh, generative AI has improved a lot. And, you know, there was 3.5 and GPT-4 came out. So, and... So that's just personal use, right? You're using for blogs and white papers and maybe writing emails and whatnot. But the enterprise use of generative AI is also exploding for one one year, more than one year. And a lot of people in the audience, uh, you know, you can look at your employer, what industry you are in, and you will find, you know, large text of blobs or images and and how you can use your, whether it's your internal employees, your your customers out there how you can um and we i talked about a lot of use cases in, in my example so you can you can definitely come with use cases initiate a generative ai project in your organization do proof of concept you know and then go from proof of concept to implementation where you can actually use it so so just as a you know wrap up i think it's it's, it's a great technology and with how the large language models become so effective so good i think it's going to be really good tool for enterprises to innovate and add these features in their applications. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Well, I would like to give a huge thank you to our speakers today for coming on board and sharing their insights and expertise with us. Once again, Michael Argawal, Director, Director and Global Practice Leader, Cloud Databases at Datavail. Krishna, Director and Global Practice Leader, MySQL and MariaDB at Datavail and Jorge Anikama, Practice Leader Analytics at Datavail. So if you would like to review this presentation or send it to a colleague, you can use the same exact URL that you used for today's live event. It will be archived and you will receive an email once the archive is posted. And as I mentioned earlier, just for participating in today's event, you could win this $100 Amazon gift card. The winner will be announced on March 29th. We'll let you know if you're the lucky viewer. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.